Cosmic rays, unlike the name suggests, are not rays. I know, I know. It's just a historical accident when we originally discovered these kinds of things. We thought they were some new form of radiation, but they're not. It's complicated. Anyway, cosmic rays are actually particles. They're electrons, protons, sometimes nuclei of helium all the way up to iron that are just absolutely flooding the universe. They just zip around everywhere, like soaking. We're, we're used to the idea. We're used to the idea of radiation filling the universe, of, of starlight, a light emitted by gas clouds, the cosmic microwave background. It's a little bit more difficult for us to imagine particles flooding the universe because, because we can't see them. But you can detect them, and actually, you can you can build. This is this is so awesome. You can build a cosmic ray detector in your own home right now. It's actually not too complicated. It's not like you need crazy, weird, uh, expensive, exotic ingredients. It's just household stuff. And one of my favorite constructions for making a cosmic ray detector is to take a uh, fish tank, you know, like a 10-gallon tank or whatever. It doesn't have to be uh, too, too big. And then you're going to get some dry ice. And if you want some dry ice, go to your local ice cream shop and just ask them for some, and they'll have a bunch, and they'll give it to you or sell it to you. And put the dry ice at the bottom of the tank or just underneath the glass bottom of the tank. Then take a metal plate, uh, you know, from... Um, the metal plate store. I don't know you know exactly where you get metal plates, but there's there's lots of metal plates floating around. Put that at the bottom of the tank. And the goal here is to make the metal really, really cold. It's a really great conductor of heat. So it's going to get very, very cold from the dry ice. Then you pour some rubbing alcohol in the bottom of the tank. And because it's so cold, the rubbing alcohol will condense and it will pull water vapor out of the air and make that condense too and you'll get a cloud. So the whole point of this apparatus was to build a layer of cloud or fog in the bottom of the tank. Then you turn off all the lights, shine a flashlight in there and just wait. And what you'll see if you're patient enough and if you got enough fog, enough cloud in this in this chamber, by the way, it's called a cloud chamber, is you'll see a little pew, pew, like little zips, like, like just little bullets. You won't see the bullets themselves, but you'll see the tracks pass through this little cloud. And what you're seeing are cosmic rays. You are seeing these little particles. In most cases, you're not seeing the actual particles that were generated from halfway across the universe. Most of the time, one of these particles strikes a molecule of nitrogen or oxygen in the upper atmosphere and then creates a shower of spray of what we call secondary particles, mostly muons. And so it's usually those products of the cosmic ray collisions happening in the upper atmosphere that you actually see here on the surface. Every once in a while, though, a primary cosmic ray does come barreling through and will hit your little detector. And you get these little tracks because these are high energy charged particles. And as they pass through that water vapor, that little cloud, they, they ionize any, any molecules, any atoms that they strike or pass near. And then that ionized particle serves as a condensation point. In, and so you get slightly higher densities of the cloud, of the fog, of the water molecules, and then that's what generates the tracks, and then they evaporate in back into equilibrium with the fog. And so you get these old tracks, and then they dissolve, little track and a little dissolve. And these cosmic rays, just doing that simple experiment, shows you how pervasive these cosmic rays are. Even though they're totally invisible, you can't see them, but they are definitely there. And they're constantly flooding through us all the time. In fact, some a certain percentage of cancer is caused by cosmic rays. How crazy is that? That's because, once again, high energy charged particle passing through you can ionize some of your nucleotides, can basically snip apart some of your DNA, which can lead to replication errors. And if that gets uncontrolled, that's that's cancer. That is a source of cancer, a 
cosmogenic source of cancer, if you will. So cosmic rays come from all over the universe. They come from our sun. They come from high energy sources, supernova, active galactic nuclei, blazars, quasars, uh, magnetars. Just if there's an R in the universe, it's probably generating cosmic rays. And of course, things like cloud chambers were how we originally detected cosmic rays, but now we have much more sophisticated apparatuses. Apparati? Not exactly sure. Feel free to let me know in the comments. One of the primary ways of actually spotting cosmic rays in real life is through the air shower itself. So when the cosmic ray strikes something in the upper atmosphere, creates a shower of particles, creates this cascade of lower energy particles. And some of these particles still have a tremendous amount of energy because the cosmic rays are coming in screaming fast. And these secondary particles are traveling faster than the speed of light. Don't get sassy on me. Faster than the speed of light in air. You know, that light slows down in a medium, like passing through air or water or glass or whatever. It's if a particle travels faster than the speed of light in that medium, it emits a very special kind of radiation called Cherenkov radiation. It's a vaguely bluish glow emitted by these particles. We see it in, we tend to see it in nuclear reactors where there's these secondary particles generated too. And what there there basically is, is there's a flash of blue light. There's a flash of blue light shrank our radiation. So if you have special telescopes, they're staring at the sky, looking for this very specific wavelength, the blue light, they'll stare, 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 and they'll see a flash. They know a cosmic ray came streaming in. There's also flashes of light from fluorescence. When the cosmic ray or its secondaries pass through the atmosphere, it can ionize air molecules the same way it can ionize the gas the vapor in a cloud chamber or your DNA, it can ionize those. And then when those those ionized particles recombine, they emit a little bit of light. That's fluorescence, the exact same way that the aurora work, but just one at a time. So again, special kinds of telescopes looking for that fluorescence. You can also look for the cosmic rays themselves or usually their secondaries on the ground by having, say, a giant tank of water. Instead of a, a cloud chamber, you can have a big water chamber. And again, you watch for these tracks passing through the container. You have a bunch of photosensitive uh, detectors ringing each, each water tank. You can put the water tanks over a broad area so you can search for very rare particles, very high energy particles. In all the cases, whether you're looking at Cherenkov or fluorescence or direct ground-based detectors, you usually don't see the cosmic ray itself. You don't see that high energy particle that was born usually outside the solar system itself. You see its products. You see some result of that particle passing through our atmosphere or the result of the particle passing through your detector. So you see the shower of secondary particles that's created, the muons and so forth, or you see the flash of light. In either case, you have to do some reconstruction. You have to do some modeling to get back at the original cosmic ray. You're just seeing the after effects, not the primary thing itself. So you have to reconstruct its direction, its energy, its components. Was it just a proton? Was it a nuclei of something heavier? You That in, it requires a lot of very detailed calculations, a lot of detailed observations. And this uncertainty leads to a lot of not a lot, but more uncertainty than we would prefer in studies of cosmic rays because we're not seeing the ray, the cosmic ray itself. We're seeing its after effects and then we have to go back and model what caused that. That modeling step introduces some uncertainties into the math. And so when we talk about cosmic ray energies or source directions, there's always a little bit of fuzziness that we're not typically used to when we're talking about regular electromagnetic radiation because 
we have to do a lot of reconstructions on that signal. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed, please hit like and subscribe. Don't forget to hit the notification icon so you get notified when I go live. Go to patreon.com slash PM Sutter. There's a link right there to help support this show and go watch another video. I'd appreciate it. See you next time.